All right, we are back after lunch. And Yanni, you get to hang out here yet again with, with, with us. Uh, Michael Yang with Comcast Ventures. Uh, we're gonna shift gears now uh, and, and talk a little bit more about uh, data, uh, of course, because it's a common theme throughout this uh, conference. Uh, but like uh, the other panel, I would love each of these esteemed gentlemen to kind of quickly introduce yourself and what you do. Uh, Ryan was up here not too long ago, so he'll give us a quick refresher. Yep, uh, Ryan Pedelak, CEO, Unique Influence, Performance Advertising Agency. Work with a lot of brands in the fitness tech space like Beachbody, Everly Well, Cellucor. That's it. Uh, Monir Zak, Director of Tech and Innovation at the US Olympic Committee, working with athletes to uh, identify what are some of the major challenges that they're facing to get onto the podium and win a certain competition. And then on the other hand, working with all of the technology inventors, innovators, creators, entrepreneurs on the market to generate those solutions that would satisfy the problems of uh, Team USA athletes. So, uh, still Yoni Kettunen and co founder of First Beat. My name is Dr. Stephen LaBeouf, and I'm one of the founders and president of Valencell. And Valencell is kind of an interesting company in the space because we don't make our own wearable devices. We make core sensor technology that goes in those devices. Great. So let's start off, uh, and I'd like to get each of your perspectives. Um, since this is about data, what are really interesting data elements, data types? Um, and it's to be slightly different since you're focused on marketing and, and advertising than some of the other guys. But I'm just curious, like when when you're hearing about devices and software, you know, very quickly, what do you glom to in terms of what are those things generating that you think is going to be actually most useful uh, for your particular businesses and, and and kind of the industry writ large? Well, for for us at Valencell, you know, we uh, the, when we look at data that comes out, we generate the raw metrics that come out. So we spit out of our technology the heart rate, the R interval, the, the, the pulse pressure, a variety of different things come out. But also we, we provide out these metrics that let you know how to, well you can trust the data. So you know like is this heart rate really right or is this R interval really right? So for us we look at those raw metrics that come out. And then also we look at uh, making sure you know whether or not you can trust them or not. Now, uh, our partners, they do a lot more with the data. Actually, some of our partners uh, work with Yoni and his team. And, and you know, our metrics go into his, his algorithms and then spit out really meaningful assessments. Yeah, so we are pretty dependent, actually, with these guys and we, with others working on sensors to get accurate sensor data. So that's, what, that's one. It's, it's unthinkable today in the sports market to develop a sustainable, successful sports program without relying on data. You're not going to rely exclusively on data because you want to have that arts side of the sports also uh, coming in and the human element coming in. Ah, the human element. <laughs> right? I mean, if you talk to, to any coach, they tell you that the best, the best coaches or the best sports programs are the ones that find the best balance between the science and the arts. Right? The, the arts is always going to be part of the sports, but now we're driving more and more science into, into sports, and I'd say finally we're starting to tune into the athletes' bodies and helping the athletes understand what their bodies have been trying to tell them mm. for thousands and thousands of years. You know, we used to do it in the labs. Mm. Now we're doing it on the skiing slopes, in the speed skating rinks, on the wrestling mats, um, and anywhere that the actual sports action is happening. Yeah, when I think about uh, data in the context of fitness and I think about the people who are mostly thinking about their body image and you know, using that data, so think of like BMI, weight, uh, and certainly things like heart rate and other sort of fitness indicators, activity can help uh, tell a full story. But I think the magic is bringing that all together so that you can see a holistic picture of what's going on and make better decisions from that. So it has been posited a lot of the data that's generated out there is more buyer beware, right? As a consumer, recreational kind of athlete, you know, someone aspiring to better fitness, how do you know this thing's spitting out X, another thing's spitting out, you know, X plus one, uh, where yeah, this, are we in that? This is, you know, a big thing that Valence has to deal with all the time because you, so really the bottom line is you gotta be good enough for the use case. And so one of the things that's happened now is like, um, you know, this, for example, some companies like uh, Orange Theory, for example, their whole use case is predicated on extremely accurate heart rate. Yeah. I mean, it's got to really work. Otherwise, yeah. the whole thing doesn't work at all. And so they, they like to use products powered by Valencell because they know that that's really going to work. But the thing is, sometimes we fail. 
We're not perfect either. And so having some way to let you know that you can't trust this reading can be really helpful. Helpful, helpful so you don't present the wrong exertion or intensity for the person, say, in Orange Theory, but also if, say, you're going to do a VO2 max calculation to know, I sure as hell ain't going to use this data in it because that's going to give me an erroneous result. Uh, and so one of the things, we do a lot of validation. We do a, a ton of validation at all the different stages. That kind of helps us. But then also having some way to know that you can really trust the data We've had to do more R&D to make sure that that confidence measurement could really be, could really be trusted, <laughs> that you could have confidence in the confidence indicator. Yeah. When, on our end, we started working with lots and lots of companies, honestly, like five, five years ago, just after the Olympic Games from uh, the, the London. It was just before the wearable tech sort of apex happened, right, in the early 2014. And we found ourselves struggling with lots and lots of offering on the market, but not knowing really what kind of validation there was behind them. So then, uh, philosophically, we decided to focus first and foremost on identifying what are the real problems that we have and then finding solutions for those problems. And then the second thing we did was mm -hmm. configure around the United States Olympic Committee an, an ecosystem that has within it all of the technology providers, but also all of the scientific institutions that can validate the, the technology. So before we even knew, before we use any technology on our athletes or before mm -hmm. our developers uh, or the companies that we're working with that develop the technologies, provide us the solutions that it has to go through a thorough scientific validation through one of our scientific partners. And you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see at a certain point you know, on the market some kind of a body that would standardize you yeah. know, what, what, what does the number mean and if I have three brands that are measuring the same thing, why am I getting three different readings, right? Right, I mean, you, know, you highlight a pretty significant problem which is uh, if we have data operability, which means that this data can be used in very, uh, various algorithms, then you know, we can actually start to see whether or not those algorithms are giving us data that we believe in. Um, you know, I think companies tend to have problems when there start to become too many of these black box algorithms that nobody really understands. And then the question is, well, how do you measure it? You're going to have to have a third party really validate that. And you know, without that, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to believe that. So yeah, definitely that data in a vacuum is, is tricky. And I feel like uh, you know, that's what we need to solve. You know, Ryan, what we're seeing even more problems with on that front, right on that topic, is uh, you know a lot of folks are learning to use some really interesting AI tools now yeah. to take the data and do stuff with it. But then say something as simple, simple even mm -hmm. simpler than heart rate, act, say activity tracking, for example, steps. Uh, if you're not measuring them the same way, you know you have to train your model on all these different devices. That's you know mm -hmm. ridiculous to do that. So if if you want to use the uh, use the same model you developed the same way across these different devices, you need to make sure they're measuring things in the same kind of acuity. And, and that's kind of uh, dissociated right now. That's one of the problems we're seeing with folks who, who make these models like, wow, that's an awesome model. Too bad it'll only work on two or three devices. You know? <laughs> yeah, so the, the more professional the use case is, the more, more dependent, uh, I mean, the more important the accuracy and reliability and validity there is. But even from a consumer point of view, the consumers are obviously getting more and more aware of the, of the discrepancies in the, in the market. and. Uh, even, you know, everybody, the, the, for most of us, there needs to be a compelling story how, how the metrics has been getting there and what is behind there. And it's just a reasonable, even, even if the conclusion would be the right, there, there needs to be an understanding of what, what's behind there, what's the, what's the, what's the ideology there. And, uh, but uh, I think more and more companies working in this field are uh, finding that you, you need to have all this validation and testing as a very integral part of your, your, um, your product development process, process and, um, and, and, and uh, as, as you indicated earlier, so all the validation, all of that work, it does need to be related to the actual use case. Yeah, we're seeing more skeptics and we dig it, actually. Yeah. Is there, uh, are, are you guys aware of any kind of consumer advocacy group, any standards body or any higher mm -hmm. organization that wants to come out and kind of be more declarative, like this approach is kind of bogus, this is directionally correct, I stand by this, Where, where's the consumer reports? You know in, CTA in is yeah. working on this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Yoni, you're on one of the councils. I know yeah, one of you, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So CTA is doing quite good work actually in this area because it's, it's a very challenging area. There's the human element in, in all, all over there. <laughs> and, the human and, element. <laughs> that's a, well, 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 yeah, we're humans. We are robots all for humans in most cases, but there are many working groups <laughs> there and the, the idea there is to uh, give more credibility for the, for the products and at least setting up standards on how, how to test, how, test the products. So, so that's, that's happening. That's good. 
Munir, what, ha what happens with uh, Olympic athletes if, you know, uh, they're given an output or a reading and they just don't, they don't buy it, you know? So how do you reconcile kind of, you know, really, I thought that was peak performance for me. You're telling me this. My coach doesn't, is shaking their head. Does the whole kind of house of cards crumble at, at that point in time? And, and what are you guys doing to kind of potentially arrest those situations? Yeah, well, you see, with the Olympic athletes, you have one chance, and that's it. You know, if, if, if you're not giving them <clears throat> a data point or a recommendation that they're buying into from day one, it's extremely hard to capture them again. You know, like here we're talking about athletes who are shaving like a thousandth of a second on, on a super G, right? Like a thousandth of a second on a, on, on a swimming competition. These guys, they're not, they're not joking, they're not kidding around, you know, they're not gonna be wasting their time doing anything that's they don't not want a mood function. Ring. They don't, want, they don't want a mood ring sensor. Yeah. No, 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 you know, like they're, they're really focused on getting that, that final objective. Yeah. Um, so I would say going back to the human element, you know, these are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant athletes who you want to help them go beyond where the human capabilities have been set, right? And you, have, you do have one chance with them to get, to get buy-in, but also you have to take into consideration of what does their life look like and what is their technology appetite? You know, like you're not going to be approaching a boxer like you approach a Taekwondo athlete. You you're want to not, stay a little farther away from a boxer, right? With a boxer, you want to stay, yeah, definitely, out of the ring. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but then, you know, like the way that you approach a skier and a, and a, and a speed skater and a soccer player and a basketball player mm -hmm. and a boxer and a Taekwondo athlete and a wrestler are just so, so, so different. Uh, the one struggle that we get with lots and lots of companies that approach us, you know, with great technologies, is coming with a solution and then convincing us that we have a problem, right? And most of the times, man, we don't really have that problem. Yes, it's going to help us. What's an example? Get an accuracy. So an example would be let's let's take boxing, right? So a company comes to you and tell, hey, we can give you, we can run AI data to help you determine what is the punching uh, frequency of your athletes. Okay, you know, give it to the coach, and coach says, all right, you know, that's fine. But yeah. I'm, I'm not really interested in that, right? All I want to know is, you know, how fit is my, is my boxer? You know, am I doing anything that's going to break her down? Am I training her too much? Am I training her too little? Yeah. Are we flying on the right plane? Are we making the right connections? Are we getting in time to the competition? I mean, like, something that could make a big difference in uh, elite training would be the measurement of lactate acid, lactate threshold, and to figure out whether or not uh, what training zones people are in and you know, if a wearable could do that easily mm -hmm. and uh, cost effectively, that would be meaningful. And a lot of the people that have made these devices, some of them uh, have used you know, methods that maybe like, aren't measuring things as properly as they should be. Yeah. So that's a big opportunity, but also you, know, you take that to a coach, and it's like, yes, I'd love to make that use that data, but then the question is, well, you know, is, does the data work? Totally, totally, yeah. And is it, and is it um, actionable? You know, yeah. I mean, is, it, is it humanized enough so that I, as a coach, who have no idea what wearable technology means, all I know is let's pick up my phone and text my, my athletes, am I going to be able to understand what those scientific numbers mean, right? And what no. are you as a company <laughs> making so that you translate into my language what, what I understand? And this is a big challenge, I mean, for the yeah. technology providers because mm. you can't have your wrestling product and boxing product and soccer product and basketball product, right? Mm. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very unique challenge, I want to say, to the sports market. I mean, to jump on this, just if you don't mind, I mean, the, this particular point, I feel like is so tricky, right? So you have this data, and then how do you actually develop insights from it, but then furthermore, how are you going to create actionable insights from it? And the you know the wearables companies, like they don't want to create those actionable insights for you, it seems like they kind of want to be a little bit disconnected from that. And really the question is like, well where are we going to get that from? You know, it needs to come from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's a big gap. Let, let's talk about uh, form factor parts of the body. You know, lots of evolution, it feels like every part from head to toe now has something out there that is tracking something related to activity and, and, and beyond. Um, what's, what's your perspective? Um, and if athletes are particular, uh, they're particular, meaning they don't want it here, they want it there, are you willing to make the trade-offs uh, and, and how do you think through that? What, I'm um, sorry. But uh, they also, we, you know, we do a lot of stuff on different form factors. I mean, you know, we have folks that make earbuds, people that make headbands, helmets, a lot of technology, armbands, wristbands, leg bands, integrated in clothing. It depends on the use case and what they're trying to do. Uh, where where are we with earbuds, by the way? Are we, like, 
heart rate, can we do this with earbuds? Oh yeah, the, the, as a matter of fact, uh, it, it used to be most of our business was actually ear oriented. Okay. You know, uh, it, it, you know for example, one of our uh, customers, Jabra, has a really successful product uh, called the Jabra Leaf Sport, and it's all in the earbuds. And the ears, ears, one of the best places, the other places you butthole, but we decided not to go that route. <laughs> the, the ear is ear versus the rear, I think is a little bit better. And so, so but the ear is the that best place That could be the sound for the day right there. <laughs> the ear is the best place in the body to measure other than the ear, yeah. like a lot of these biometrics. But the thing about it, it also depends on the use case. You know, people usually don't want to walk around with an earbud in all the time. That's why the wrist devices, the arm devices sure. are- But while you're working out, it's great, device. like the ear pods and everything. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's great for the exercise use case. Yeah. And also also some calling center use cases also where they want to monitor the stress of the folks. Uh, it's an interesting use case where we're seeing traction in there now. But uh, the, the reality is all variety of different form factors for different things. One of the reasons why the leg can be useful is uh, on the leg, if you can get a good measurement on the leg, you can also potentially assess the oxygenation in the leg, which can help you with the muscle oxygenation aspect. And so some people like to use those types of things, either in the upper leg or lower. So it, it kind of depends on what you're after. And I want to take us back to the holistic point that, that you brought up earlier on, right? I mean, if, if, and I'm, I'm approaching this from, a, from an elite athlete's perspective, right? There, there's not one specific technology, one specific formula that, I, that is correlated with success, right? Otherwise, it's going to be just one, one shiny company that is like defining what is the formula for, for best outcome. Uh, success comes from a holistic perspective, right? And whenever we're able to help athletes understand how they, um, like how eating and sleeping and mental focus and training and traveling influences their results, then we're, we're positioning them in a very, very good spot. So when we're looking at a holistic perspective, my philosophy is to shift us away from looking at the discrete moments in time that we're able to capture data from and go towards a platform that would allow us to actually measure data from the athlete's body on a 24-hour perspective. And if, if we look around the room, I'd say there are really two common elements among each and everyone in this room. One is we are clothed, and we are going to be a clothed species at least for the next 50 years, right? We could... Well, we, I'm, about to, yeah. I'm about to change that right agree, right? <laughs> And the second one is that we all have supercomputers in our pockets. So if you think about, let's take away the shower moment, right? Or when you're bathing. Sure. The whole, the whole, like the remaining 23 hours and a half of your daily life, you are clothed in some fashion. Yeah, especially if you're gonna put it like in underwear or something like that, which Underwear's I saw are the bra, socks, if you're, like, wh yeah. whatever it is, right? Yeah. The problem yeah, is people like to wash the clothes. That's been one of the biggest problems with the Totally, clothes. yeah, but, but this, and, they see some of those know, problems. Things get ruined when you wash it too much. But now there are, but now there are uh, washable devices, too. Well, allegedly. allegedly. But the, you know, the, the problem is, it just, it'll tell you, uh, I love the clothes, you know, we, we have partners who integrate our yeah, items in the sure. clothing, and, and also uh, uh, bands of various kinds that can be washed. Uh, the problem is, especially with the electrodes right now, it's hard to keep those robust uh -huh. over several washes. And, and I, I, that's one of the big limiting factors right now we're seeing. I think there's a lot of folks working on ways to solve that issue and also make it to where you really can have multiple pairs of underwear yeah. that have the sensors in it so you're not using your one favorite pair for when you want to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. But once, I mean, you know, but once that gets figured out, I mean, we were, we were, I was looking at growth and I put up a chart earlier on it. You know, clothing was the number one area of growth mm -hmm. and that we're looking at over the next five years. So. But they've been saying that for the last 20. Until, they, so, yeah, until somebody it, figures so it that's, out. So that's the thing, you know, I, I, I love the idea of clothing. As a matter of fact, at North Carolina State where I got my PhD, there's a huge program on it and they're making a lot of progress on it for different things. Mm -hmm. It's just there are a lot of technical challenges yeah. left. You know, the science scientist in me is like, okay, when are these going to be overcome so we can finally have that mm. that visage of being integrated into clothing just really seamlessly. So a lot of the data points have been uh, derived from sources on the body, so a lot of inference from there. What what is the role of data that comes from blood, from saliva, in in your respective realms? It, it is, uh, for us, it's, it's invaluable. You know, uh, what, what, as, as much as we can tap into the physiological element of the body, the more uh, knowledge we have, the more empowered we are to help athletes understand how their body's behaving, the better the training programs are, and, you know, a uh, sequence of steps to get you to success, right? And I'm, I'm a firm believer that innovating at each and every step of the process is going to lead you eventually to a very, very successful program. That's, that's what we saw with someone like uh, Michael Phelps, right? Mm -hmm. Michael became the legend Olympian by following a very strict, smart training approach, not a hard training approach like he used to 15 years ago. 
you know, and, and by giving Michael the insights into how, how his body is behaving on a daily basis and empowering him to make daily decisions on how, what, what kind of training should I do today, empowered him to become the legend Olympian that, that he is. And, you know, you, you delve further and further into sort of uh, saliva, and then you take it also down to the genetic code and the genetic testing that is coming down the line, you know. So specifically it's, for Phelps, you guys were sampling saliva on a regular frequency, and you did a genetic makeup on him as well. Um, no, no, I wouldn't go that far. Okay. That, that is where and I see And you cloned him. The what? <laughs> Admit it, you cloned and, him. No, man, man. <laughs> Was he doing drugs? <laughs> no, no, you know what? I'd say that the future of sports tech is, is, is we are very exciting. With Michael, we did, like, we did so many things. The one thing that I can disclose with you is helping my, uh, Michael monitor his, his sleep cycle uh, on a daily basis between 2012 and 2016 so that he was making a decision every morning for about 1,000 mornings. Mm -hmm. And it was him and his coach deciding on what is our training today. Based the, on what happened last night. Based on what happened last night, right? And based on you know how, what was the quality of sleep. Cool. And stepping away from setting training plans that are sort of monthly, weekly, you know, like mesocycles, macrocycles, uh, and going to daily uh, training programs. And yeah. when, when you can dive into that level and empower the coach and the athlete at that point to make the decisions without See, having to have a scientist. I'd like to know more about how y'all do this because I tell you, so there was a big story recently out this one uh, from one company that collected a lot of sleep data from a lot of folks. And the, big, the headline of the story, when I saw it it, it, it talked about how they figured out that if you, if you go to bed the same time in the morning and you wake up, excuse me, go to bed at the same time in the evening, <laughs> and you wake up at the same time in the morning every day, that your sleep quality, by the way they measured it, was, was much better. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool, but the thing about it is, you know, since they've been sentient beings on this planet, mothers have told their children this. And so it terrified me because I thought, well, there, you know, there's tons of NIH papers where this has already been shown. What I what I'd like to see, and I, I'm curious if these, the companies have these models now and just are waiting to show them, is things like, for example, like you were talking about. I'd like to know, like, how does my sleep affect my VO2 max, or am I immune to it? Some people mm -hmm. may be less sensitive mm -hmm. to sleep and VO2 max. I'd like to know myself personally, myself. I actually really like to know that, <laughs> but you know, knowing that I need to go to bed at certain times, I know that I'm violating that rule, and I know that there's, you know, according to Shannon's theory of information, there's no information there. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I'm, I'm curious how y'all use that to, 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 to make that, you know, connect those dots. You see, in, in our case, we take, I'd mm -hmm. say, the opposite uh, side of the spectrum. We're not after discovering, you know, what, 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 is, what is the golden nugget in sleep science. We're after, mm -hmm. in this case, Michael. Right? What makes Michael a better athlete? How can we help Michael make daily, make daily decisions in function of what his body looks like, what his life looks like, you know, given, given that he's a very high profile athlete uh, high, who's traveling a lot, he's got lots of media engagements, lots of sponsor engagements, plus training, plus family, and how can we help him make that one decision every morning that would empower his body to give him more, or to give him exactly what his body can give him, not less, not more. It, so are, are we talking more about the measurement and capture of things relevant for recovery as opposed to a lot has been focused on expenditure and uh, exertion? You, you know, where, where are we in that kind of whole calculus? In, in, in our case, it's a, it's a mixture. You know, you want athletes to be fit. Uh, if athletes are not fit, if athletes are not healthy when they go to the Olympic Games, man, no matter who you have on the team, you're not going to win. So that's number one. Then when athletes are healthy, now how are you going to be managing your last week before competition so that you are peaking on that specific day, right? So those are very, very, very specific questions that don't necessarily address what the consumers are looking for, what the consumers want, but more so what does that one specific athlete need in function of where she is in her mm, athletic career today. Yeah, that's, that's what we are seeing also in, in team sports, that basically being more indi individualistic and understanding the recovery, sleep night, and that will affect your next day draining. draining. And if you're already very tired, you have, you're not recovering well, so it doesn't make sense to have very heavy, heavy training period after that. So and basically individualizing the training for each athlete, it's, it's a winning recipe for many, many teams. And, uh, and actually, uh, we believe that for consumers also, there's a lot of opportunities there that in terms of just taking account of the stress levels and, and understanding that if you're already very highly stressed, it doesn't make sense to have very high, further st high stress in your body by very heavy exercise, but rather have something more recover recovering. So just being a 
smart and uh, in, in, a, but in, in pro sports it's a 24 hour athlete concept, it's being professional and uh, sometimes just uh, measuring the stress levels outside of the training, it, uh, there are many hours, many more hours outside of training or games, games and what you're doing there, how are you preparing, preparing and so not uh, the time, the athlete may not be recovering at all, even, even the coaches may think of so and having data to understand what's happening there and then maybe you can, you can have a discussion with the athlete that you know this is how the data looks like and okay it's data, it's more objective, yeah. Maybe yeah. we need to change something. Yeah, and I feel like from an elite athlete standpoint, what you're saying uh, definitely resonates with me. So the question I think about is, okay, for the everybody else uh, mm -hmm. who is really just trying to learn a little bit more about themselves, but you know, improve their body image, uh, get more fit, you know, not get injured, things like this along the way, get better. Um, how do we make this accessible for them? Uh, came across an app called Gyroscope, which is kind of a nice, uh, puts all the data together in one place. I feel like, you know, if you can get sleep data, which they do in there along with, you know, your fitness uh, data, then I feel like in those instances, it's easier for somebody to make a decision or for like even an app like that to eventually make a recommendation about what you might do that day. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's really the question of like, how do we make this super simple for the consumer? Because, you know, what you're talking about um, to me feels like, you know, it'd be probably too much for the average consumer to, to actually worry about all that information. You, you know, the, the best way I've actually seen this implemented was at your conference. There's some girl, some professor over in the U.S., I can't remember her name right now. Mm. She was using one of your metrics for people who were uh, drinking alcohol. Yep. You, you yep. remember the name of this girl? Like, it's escaping me right now. But what she did was, so yeah. one of their metrics, they have a, um, an H HRV based, based metrics, First Beat does, that gives you a generation of a variety of things. One of them could be stress and fatigue. And what she was able to, she, she was working with students and they were having a hard time passing tests and all kinds of troubles. She was able to use, track their alcohol consumption just by the, them giving surveys about it and see how it affected their HRV profile. And it was very palpable. So she was able to show them how the drinking affected their overall fatigue and then change that. They got to see how it changed their fatigue from the data, but also see how it improved the test performance. And I thought that was really interesting because I've been looking for something like that. Like how can you really use mm. that to be meaningful to an individual personally where they can see the data, see how it's like, no, yeah, your alcohol is really screwing you up and here's the proof. Yeah. And then go, oh, I got to change that. And then, then them yeah. improving all the tests. That'd be awesome. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, where's the state of the consumer these days in terms of all of this genre of devices and, and software and applications? Ryan, like, are they coming and saying, I'm opting into this market, I'm looking to buy something, I have a specific use case, or they're just generically kind of interested yeah. and, and uh, want to learn more? Yeah. yeah, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, um, it really depends on what type of consumer you are. So. I think one of the big differentiators is, do you already have a wristwatch, a smart watch already, or some sort of device, uh, wristband? And in that case, then those people are a little bit more aware of and um, kind of the advertising messages around, here's a product that's gonna help uh, use the data that's coming out of your smart watch better. Um, certainly they're resonant to that. And there is this huge disparity, which is you know, a lot more people want these devices than have them. So that will continue to grow, and people are just actively seeking that out as they see more of these use cases um, come to bear. I think that for the people who don't already have those devices, uh, the initial hurdle we need to get them over is to get a device. You know, Obviously, the Apple Watch 3 is the most popular one, but um, some, something on a platform that has a lot of uh, flexibility. And from a marketing standpoint, what's nice is we can actually target the people that just own wearables. So like we know the people who, like if you think about it, like Apple Watch, you know, you are on Facebook on your Apple Watch. And so uh, Facebook knows that stuff. And so the reality is we can target these people and it's a good way of like approaching the market. Price points, perspectives on where they need to, to go in order for this industry to move forward. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's about the value that the products can actually deliver and that's something that we need to overcome as an in the industry to get more and more valuable products that actually consumers are willing to pay for. Pay for and, and, and so it, it's, it's early days in that, that way and me meaningful metrics that, and, and insights that really help you to guide your life and then, then the, I think the price comes after that. <laughs> 
But if there's no that value, then it's uh, yeah. the price is, I mean, why should you pay anything? Mm -hmm. it's, and, you know, I th and I think the value is continuing to get better and people are starting to see the use cases and their friends, like the measurement that their friends are doing and the decisions they're able to make accordingly, like, oh wow, that's kind of cool. And that will further drive demand, sorry. You know, they own sell since we're a sense of technology provider. You know, we get exposed to what the price constraints are. I think right now where we're at is right where it needs to be for the most part. The big thing that, you know, the things people ask us usually about these days aren't about the price so much because they're happy with the price, mm -hmm. but it's about the uh, performance and yeah. the power. Yeah. Uh, that's two of the biggest things that we hear a lot of. So it's, it's gotten to the point where it used to be price was a big issue, but because mm -hmm. it, it's really come down to where it, it's, it's kind of where it needs to be. Maybe it could get a little bit better, but you know, not too much. Munir, is there any uh, type of, is there a particular sport that you guys support that is lacking or a laggard in terms of use of technology or data because of the challenges of the particular sport? Many, many, yeah, yeah, I mean, many sports. You just have to look at, uh, traditionally, which sports have been tech-savvy sports and which sports have not been tech-savvy, you know, and it's not, there's no, no secret there. Uh, on the tech savvy side, you've got your triathletes, your cyclists, your skiers. You know those athletes have been using technology ever since you know, technology was was mm, promoted and marketed inside the sports market. On the other hand, you've got your boxers, your wrestlers, your gymnasts to some extent that rely exclusively on on gut and feeling during the game, like do, as they are training or competing on the mat uh, or in the ring. Um, they do lots and lots of testing off the mat and off the ring, which gives them very good reading on what is their physiological biomechanical status, but doesn't give them as much value as to in, like in, in action metrics. Um, taking the tradition and taking the culture of sports is extremely fundamental. You know, whenever we're working with any specific sports program, the, the, that goes back always to the human element, right? Like you can't approach a skier as you're approaching a boxer, you can't approach a triathlete as you're approaching um, a badminton player. And my guess is there's uh, less measurement happening with curling. There's less, well, <laughs> more, more, more so now than four years ago, let's put it this way. <laughs> great, we got a couple minutes left. Any questions from the audience for this great panel? Right here in the middle. Uh, there's a microphone coming down. Hi, I have a question about the dehumanizing part. I think number helps you to motivate, but sometimes lose your motivation. You know, even my level, I'm starving to death to count my calories. So I'm just wonder, especially uh, for the elite athlete, to make those athletes not to be a robot. How do you draw the line in between to uh, to utilize number? Also, the pure. Uh, what's a development athlete for the younger stuff who is going to be at elite level? How do you kind of like educate coach or athlete to use number appropriately and to be a human? You see, the, the, the personal skills there of, of the coach, I believe, play a fundamental part. And, and I'll tell you one story. With one, with one specific program that we had, uh, we are using uh, heart rate variability reading in the morning as an indicator of fitness, let's say, right? Like how, how, how ready is your body today? Which seemed to be like a great, great discovery uh, on the beginning. But then the coach started noticing that some of the athletes, specifically on day of competition, man, like their HRV readings are not good. And when the athletes read that, they're already psychologically conditioned not to win the game. Because they say, hey, my, my data is telling me that my body is not ready. Like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do today, right? So then the coach there, comes in with her human skills and you know, needs to manage those situations very carefully. So education is, is, is fundamental, you know, and just the fact that you can get a number doesn't mean that that number yeah. has to be accessible to each and every person on the team. Yeah, we have some experiences there as well, and in, in a professional team sport, it's typically the, only the coach has the metrics and numbers, and not, not the players, not the players, and the coach's job is just to use the numbers to understand what is the yeah. condition of each. But I have some experience also similar to that. That in Formula One driving, for example, so if if the if the drivers are if the athlete is very very um, dedicated into what they're doing and wants to do everything perfectly, and then the numbers can screw up everything. So you better not to share them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, um, Take one more. Anyone? Right here. <coughs> Um, your last points made me think of this. At what point do the coaches have data that 
puts actually their judgment at risk because if they have a bad data point but mm. they leave the player on the field or continue to play the yeah. play the player, at what point does that become a liability rather than an asset? It's a big issue. So. Um, the, what, what I'm seeing in, in, in our organization is um, is uh, more and more younger athletes asking the why question, right? Why, why do we need to show up for training at 5.45? Why not at 6.30, right? Why do we have to get out of bed at four? Why not at six, right? Why do we have to eat this? Why can't we just eat burgers and fries all the time, right? And coaches who are not able to answer the why question are coaches who are, who are losing popularity, let's say. Mm -hmm. So th th this, this is, it, from my perspective, I'd say it's a very nice problem to have because then it forces the coaches to actually go beyond the comfort zone sometimes and start equipping themselves with technologies that empower them to answer those why questions. But at the same time, I want to go back to the question before. Education plays a fundamental part, right? A coach is a coach because that coach has worked for many years to get to where she is today, right? And the fact that now we have new numbers does not discredit her qualifications as a coach. Being able to marry both uh, is, is, is where sort of where that magic formula uh, lies. And with that, we wrap. Please join me in thanking these great panelists. Thank you.